Hey everybody, Coach here. Hey, I hope this first week for 2021 is going smoothly so far. It has been for me, a little bit of work here and there, a little bit of research, but doing okay for now. Hey, I am glad you're here on this episode because this is going to be about winter pruning, the, the whys and the hows and what to do's. But I do wanna make a little disclaimer first. I wanna tell you that this is not like a one week immersion class of pruning everything that I had to go through many, many decades ago. This is just kind of a down and dirty overview on it. And if you really want to learn individual plant pruning things, oh my God, there is a thousand one various little channels and various little things on YouTube. Uh, all you gotta do is type in pruning whatever and guaranteed. So I didn't want to be just another repeat about something like that. Rather, I would just like to educate you a little bit on the why we do it and the types of pruning there are and go over some tools and safety and we should be pretty good, don't you think? Coach, every week I come at you with landscape tips and tricks and theories and landscape design concepts in an easy to understand format so that I can impress upon you how to take care of your yard yourself without having to rely on others and save a boatload of money in the process. You know, after almost 25 years of being in the business, I bring with me a lot of knowledge and experience that I want to share with you today's modern self-reliant homeowner of today. Believe it or not, one of the easiest ways to minimize your pruning tasks at any time of the year is making sure you have the right plants in the right place. Just like the three R's video that I'll put right up here that we covered that. If you have that, then your pruning will be next to nil and you can avoid what I'm gonna talk about here in just a few minutes. You know, many times when I'm uh, perusing Facebook groups and Reddit forums and things like that, I generally see some questions on there about how do I prune my blah, blah, blah? Or how do you, how do you approach pruning this? How do you approach pruning that? And I'll tell you what, the only way to do it is twofold. A, go find some free, down and dirty weekend classes at one of your master gardeners through your cooperative extension. That would be one way. The other way is to do things like I've done it recently, not about pruning, but about things I don't know about. And that is just YouTube it and watch it and watch multiple people and verify that the right way you see over and over and over again. That's probably one of the easiest ways to learn. Then, dang it, just get some tools and go out and carefully start. And instead of butchering, just do a little bit at a time and then go back to YouTube and verify it. Or hey, take it, uh, take it down to a, a nursery and ask one of the nurserymen, maybe they have a big box specimen of something like a Japanese maple or a, um, a pine tree or something. And you say, hey, I got some of these on my property and I need to clean them up a little bit. So what would be the best way for me to approach pruning this. Now for us regular folk with just regular tools, like I told you a few minutes ago, right plant, right place. You know, if you, if you space things out a little bit and you think of an overall plan when you've actually designed or had your place designed, then you will not get an overcrowding of various plant material that's gonna cause a need to have to space it out by butchering them and keeping spaces in between. That is not a natural landscape. And unless you have a formal garden theme, boxes and balls are not a very natural looking type of yard. And we see them all over the place. Lots of times it's just the lazy man's way of getting out and doing the chores or the pros that you have come in to maintain your yard, that's the easiest way. Guarantee you, unless you have a real specific, super special gardener, they're gonna come in with a power hedge trimmer and they're gonna 
circle and ball and box and gone. That's all they're gonna do. And please, if you have a company that has really decorative pruning skills, drop them in the, drop them in the comment before because I'd like to look them up and interview them because they are so few and so far between. When I used to do decorative pruning in the wintertime, um, people didn't really understand the niche of the landscape industry on how to come in and take a, a 15 foot <clears throat> Swan Hill olive and make it just look beautiful without taking away its natural look or Japanese maples, or Japanese black pines, or any number of other types of plant material that if you spend a few minutes and just don't it'll look a lot better, especially in the long run. One of the things you might want to avoid, especially if you're uh, shopping for property, is really take a look at the landscaping as you do your walkthrough. A first walkthrough or a second walkthrough. If you go out in the backyard and you have a uh, 30 foot Italian cypress hedge that goes along the, the back fence. And you can see that it's been maintained at 30 feet, or let's just knock it down to 20 feet, a 20 foot hedge. Can you imagine the amount of maintenance that is gonna take if you take on that piece of property? And obviously there's options that you can always exercise. You can get the property and take them out, but you know, what about just a reduction? So think about, uh, think about a maintenance issue just as you're looking at property and what kind of maintenance it's going to take on a monthly or biannual type of basis for the plant material that's there. And what kind of plant material is it and how has it been kept so far? Are you going to have a real um, uphill curve getting this place back into shape or is it in pretty good shape already and a little nips and tucks here and there and you got yourself a nice home? Think about that as well. Now, one of the things I'm not gonna do here today is I'm not gonna give you uh, uh, your mom and dad speech. Like back in my day, when I learned how to prune, um, I'm not doing that, okay? I, I was really fortunate. I, I really consider myself blessed and I got a lot of gratitude to the mentors that taught me back in the late 70s. I really, really do because you had to literally prove yourself after you've been trained that you knew how to prune, you knew when to prune, you knew what you were pruning, and you knew how to do it so that you could dispense that kind of education and information to the customers that were coming into the nursery all the time. But coach, geez, aren't you always professing here on the channel self-reliance and all that kind of stuff? Yes, I am, yes I am. But not self-reliance coupled with stupidity. I. I there's not just stupidity, it's more of a, a, a naiveness or an ignorance. And that just means we don't know what we don't know until we know it. And that's what I want to impress upon you here today is not only listening to my talking face, but also searching out and researching before you get the tools I'm gonna to talk about and you go out there on a Saturday and you start hacking and, and sawing and doing all those things. So we're gonna learn first, then we're gonna go out and we're gonna walk a little bit, then we're gonna jog, then we're gonna run, and you'll be off and running. And it's a lifelong skill that you're gonna learn. And it is just that, it's a skill. And it takes a little bit of practice. But, you know, pro ball players are pro ball players because they've done a lot of what? Over a long period of time, they've done a lot of practice and they've been trained. Well. Same thing with doctors, same thing with, with any profession, probably yours as well. But we just don't go out there willy-nilly and start doing things. Because, guys, once you cut, you can't glue it back on. You know, it, it's, it's an amputation, to put a real big term to it. Pruning is an amputation of plant material. So pruning is actually defined as a horticultural practice that deliberately removes various parts and pieces of plant material in order to boost and produce and to ensure the health of said plant. Here's the actual definition that I looked up online. It's one of many, I'm sure, but it's one that's kind of really kind of easy and straightforward. Take a look. So with all of that, 
let's get into at least three different kinds of pruning. We're going to start off with shearing and hedging. Probably one of the most common things that we ever see out there in the landscape maintenance world. We see our boxes and our balls, what I like to refer to as the green meatball. Um, this is the most common, but we don't always associate it with pruning. We take pruning and then we take shearing, but they're actually one and the same, just a different style. I look at shearing and hedging as having its place. And like I spoke to you earlier, having its place in more of a formal garden type of setting where everything is formally clipped and hedged. Shearing and hedging is basically applicable to those plant material such as boxwood, taxus, yews, privets, etc. The ones that we always attribute to property division hedges, privacy hedges, small little formal lawn border, English style garden formal hedges, but a lot of people use the shearing and hedging as a, as a lazy man's way of getting out there and getting yard chores done. You know, uh, beautiful Gulfstream Nandina are not supposed to be butchered into a ball. They're not supposed to be butchered into a box. That's not how a plant like that is supposed to function. So when you talk about shearing and hedging, think about the plant health, think about the overall look before you go out there one day and start just shearing and hedging. You know, if you had hedges such as this, you not only start having a major league type of maintenance issue, but you also start having a safety issue. You don't want to have hedges that are so tall you're having to do this. This is not normal residential landscape. And sometimes it's just ludicrous because it doesn't really serve a horticultural or landscape function anymore. Anything that is that tall is just a safety hazard waiting to happen for someone having to take care of it. Certainly the safety issue if you're trying to take it on to do this, that's not how we prune a hedge. It really isn't, okay? So don't, don't get into the habits of always shearing and hedging things that aren't supposed to be. Remember, go back to the original landscape install and put that right plant in the right place. And you won't have to be doing this style unless it's a formal garden setting, period. I don't know how much I can really stress that. It'll also save you a whole lot of time. It really will. But if you are going to have sheared hedges and stuff, I want to teach you just a little bit about the correct way to make sure the end result is like this. What we want to try to accomplish on a hedge is one that is safely maintained, maybe at seven feet or less if it's a privacy hedge, maybe if it's three feet or less if it's a neighbor, neighbor to neighbor living green fence, three, four feet at the most. But what I want you to do is practice the the pyramid style, the lazy man's pyramid style. Uh, I forget what it's called in geometry, but I want you to have a wider base of a hedge and a narrower top. So if you have a hedge that's four feet tall, it should be wider down here and then have either a crown top or a, a rectangular top so that when sun is going across in the sky, the whole hedge receives its sunlight. If you do the inverted pyramid thing, then the bottom part doesn't get the sun and the top part becomes its shade. So try to very much have a tapered look with a wide base and a narrower top. That's the best way I can tell you on how to shear and keep hedges. Okay, let's look at another type of pruning and that is the selective pruning. This term often applies to uh, pruning for shape, sometimes size, uh, production, like in fruit, fruit and berries type of thing, and overall vigor and health. For instance, if you have new trees, um, you may want to research and look up a little bit about how, what kind of tree you have and what way is it supposed to naturally grow. Now, everything that comes home in a container or is bare root or is bald and burlapped always isn't 100% growing the exact fashion that Mother Nature tend them to do. You have modified leaders, you have central leaders, you have different ways. And where you're putting it, considering you have got the right plant in the right place, you know, you may have to modify it just a little bit. 
and that is where you start doing pruning for uh, uh, thinning out a little bit of the crown, reducing the crown in an older tree, thinning the crown so that it doesn't become a wind sail and tip over, uh, and pruning specific ways to make, encourage uh, fruiting spurs and uh, fruiting buds on certain fruit trees too. Selective pruning is very, very important when it comes to certain types of ornamentals as well. You know, we all know about pruning roses. Everyone has heard about pruning roses. Pr pruning roses is one of the simplest plants you can prune ever, provided that you have the right tool, a little bit of protection like gloves, and getting in there. You, you, you can hardly hurt it when it's dormant. And during the growing season, you can prune it as well. You can, you can go in there and find the, the spent flowers, come back down the stem, find that five leaf leaflet there, and you can prune it right at that. And it'll redo its blooming wood within a matter of a few weeks and you can bloom all over again. But usually pruning roses is something where you're gonna take it down to about 12, maybe 18 inches, depending on what kind of rose it is, if it's a, a flower carpet shrub rose, and I'll put a list to one of our plants of the week on that. Um, you, can, you can basically take that thing down almost to the ground and just let it flush out in the following spring. And you can do that provided it's not in a massive heat wave. You can do that during the growing season too. If it's starting to crowd other things or it's getting a little too big for britches where you have it, okay? So roses are some of the easiest ones. Other ones that I've gotten questions about is like hydrangeas. You know, when you have a hydrangea plant, a lot of times people don't know what kind it is. You know, if you really don't know, then easiest way is not to knock it all the way to the ground. Kind of treat it as go in and take out dead wood and that kind of stuff. Remember, there's a couple different kinds. There's the, the animal kind of um, hydrangea, and then there's a, the panicle kind. And usually the Annabelle kinds are a lot easier. You can, you can butcher those things in the wintertime down six, eight inches of the ground, and they'll flush back out. But when you buy it, make sure you find out if it's one that blooms on new wood or one-year-old wood. If it's the panicle kind, which is generally the, the old wood type, uh, like oak leaves and uh, uh, vining hydrangeas, they're a little harder to take care of, especially if you're in the colder climates. They, they tend to be a little more fussy as far as what wood they're actually going to bloom on, and you really always can't predict it. But for those of you who are up in those colder climates and may have those type of hydrangeas, hey, take a snip of it during the growing season, hit your local certified nurseryman in town and say, hey, what's the best way for me to approach this to always increase the health and vigor and blooming of this particular hydrangea, whatever it is. Now, when I was a young whippersnapper, just starting out and I got my certified nurseryman certificate and all that other stuff, uh, I was allowed by my company to prune people's uh, bare root fruit trees when they came into the nursery in January and February and got them. And I always had this little, this little uh, funny disclaimer that I, I'd always compliment them on their, uh, their selection. And they would bring in this beautiful big bare root with this little huge little bare root cluster of root system there. And I would tell them what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this back to ensure that this tree is gonna take off for you when you get it home and it starts pushing in the springtime. And they would be very happy. They would be really enthused. And then they would hand me that fruit tree and I would take my pruners out and like Edward Scissor hands, I would reduce that tree by about 50%. And I would take care of any sort of smashed or broken dead root system. And I would wrap it up in butcher paper and I would hand it back to them while I looked at my customer's face and they were like, I just paid $17 for that now? Yeah. You did, but you know something? Very seldom, very seldom did we ever have bare root fruit trees coming back to the nursery saying, this thing's dead, it's died, and it's because you guys pruned it wrong. Nope, we didn't. We generally had about a 90 plus percent success rate that never ever came back dead. Okay, so that was a little, a little bit of uh, fruit tree history. And if you go get fruit trees, expect a good nurseryman to do just that. And if they don't do it, if you get it at a box store or something, 
guarantee you they won't do it. So read up on it just a little bit. You're gonna have to prune it just a little, maybe take some of the, the size of it out because you have to remember they have dug that thing up out of the ground, removed 50% or more the feeder root system from underground and they've left the tops on it so it looks like you get the most bang for your buck. Look how big a tree I got for half the price of a containerized tree. It's all well and good, but don't stick that thing in the ground you're gonna be about a 50-50 chance that it's actually gonna do what you want it to do. Reduce the size of that upper, that upper tree by at least 50%. Be patient, because it's gonna take off, and make sure you follow the bare root planting either on the bag, what the nurseryman has told you, or anything that you can find online. You can always email me and I can tell you exactly how to do it depending on the type of plant or tree that you bought. You know, at Weed Patch, before we sold that loving home that I miss right now, um, I had like over 90 Frantoyo uh, fruiting olive trees that I had to tackle every winter or every other winter, depending on how much they grew. And that was quite a chore. You know, I was out there for the better part of uh, two and a half weeks doing it. I would generally do kind of like uh, five to six trees a day. And obviously with a couple of days off, but man, did I love the way that orchard looked when it was all said and done. With the new green grass that was coming up, I would get out there with my ride-on mower and, and clean it all up and make it look pretty. You know, check it out. I mean, I, I think it looked really good after it was all pruned up. It really had uh, an ornamental shape to it, but at the same time, those things produced, and they produced very well. The last harvest we had before we sold it was 48 gallons off of 90 trees. And what would you do with 48 gallons of olive oil? Drop me a comment below and let me know. Uh, we had to give it away. We split it with the, the, the producer in the mill that we had, and then we still gave a lot more away because we couldn't use 30 gallons of olive oil. But it was a fantastic looking orchard, and it was very, very appealing to the people who bought the place. Now I talked about uh, dormant fruit tree pruning and bare root fruit tree pruning. But you can also go in there uh, at various times during the growing season and prune successfully while the fruiting is going on. Uh, an example was peaches and nectarine trees that I had at Weed Patch Ranch. I would go in there when we uh, had done our first thinning of fruit and usually we had just a bolting, a great bolting of foliage. And right about June, I went in with my little hand pruners and I would selectively take out some of the big shoots, uh, some of the sucker wood that was coming up in the center, and I would really thin out and open up each tree, and there was 12 of them, and I would allow that sunlight to start penetrating down in there, the airflow to come through so we didn't have, and then the, the greenery, the foliage, the food producer of those trees got all that extra sunlight and we found that it was very successful in getting bigger and better tasting fruit when it came to harvest time. It really did. So just because uh, it's a cherry tree or an apple tree or a peach or nectarine or an apricot, it doesn't mean you can't go in there and carefully prune, especially if you get some kind of a windstorm damage or whatever. You can always go in and prune, just don't prune massively. And a good rule of thumb is, especially during the growing season, never remove more than a third of the plant. Um, it's just not necessary. You can always do it during the dormant season if you need to go much, much aggressive on it. And when it comes to that small dinky little orchard that I had, all of them were ultra dwarf fruit trees. So they did not get past the eight foot level and I always kept them at the six foot level or less. Why you ask? Well, which is easier? going up a ladder and picking way above your head at the top of a six foot ladder or an eight foot ladder, or having something six feet high and you're picking here on the safety of the ground and you're not having to lean. You can just walk around the tree and harvest your fruit. So again, proper selection of the plant in the beginning is really gonna help you when it comes to pruning and managing those trees. So let's talk briefly about pruning perennials. A lot of times perennials, in, in my humble opinion, are like the bread and butter of any sort of landscape. You have some uh, bones of the yard as far as your shrubbery, 
and sometimes once a year or so that some of that shrubbery may give you a real bang for your buck color wise uh, but you know those perennials they can they can make your place a showstopper throughout the whole growing season with a little bit of proper pruning now take for instance uh, one of my favorite plants that i used a lot was uh, tick seed uh, better known as coreopsis and i would uh, I would get in there after their first major beautiful spring flush and I would get in there and I would just basically deadhead the whole thing. I would just deadhead them back and give them a good feeding and within four weeks they'd be back blooming as big or not bigger than before. Um, same thing with the roses, same thing with, uh, now there's some perennials like for instance a stilby comes to mind. A stilby is not a a whole season long but you can get a secondary bloom out of it if you take off those beautiful feathery flower heads that they get in the springtime and you'll get a small secondary bloom and then a stilby is kind of basically over with uh, but you can get some on daylilies you can get on shasta daisy and other plants like that you can extend out their blooming period for many many weeks or even months Another one that does a really good job is like the upright fuchsias. If you get a, a, a big, big first push and a nice bloom in early summer, well, before that tall upright fuchsia goes to berry, make sure you go in and nip and tuck it, give it a good feeding, usually of a, a low organic type of fertilizer like fish emulsion or something like that, and they will put out another one and even an early fall one if you take care of it, probably every six weeks or so, and it'll keep going the whole season long. Where I was located in Northern California, I did a lot of this perennial pruning right after January, especially for Coreopsis and some of the other ones. Um, I didn't want any new spring growth starting to push uh, any sooner than February. You know, after for us, the danger of frost, we rarely had frost after the months of January. They were more like late November, December, maybe early January, and then that was, that was kind of it. But uh, I would generally let Coreopsis just die back to the ground. I'd leave the foliage, the dead foliage in place, and then I'd come through in the early spring and clean it all up. I'd see next year's growth, the little growth clump right there, and be able to uh, prune it back give it some food and it was ready to go for the next season okay so there you go on decorative pruning remember we talked about the the shaping the sizing the production uh, and the overall vigor and health goes towards selective pruning okay the last one we're going to talk about is decorative decorative pruning is where the artistic side of the pruning world comes to comes to fruition comes to bear uh, we have all seen uh, various pictures online and in movies and other things uh, beautifully boneside beautifully uh, containerized bonsai type of plants whether it be little miniature forests of Japanese maples or juniper or um, podocarpus or any of the other ones that are used for oh a real one is like cotoneaster horizontalis and you would be able to make it just wander out of the tray the patience that it takes to create something like that absolutely boggles and amazes me those guys are truly artists but decorative pruning also applies to a lot of other genre in the landscape uh, we can go back to shearing and we see uh, poodled and topiary type of plants privets and junipers uh, we've seen arborvitae and other stuff take a look at these couple of pictures as i continue you will find that uh, if this is your bag then make sure you know you practice on something small and work your skill set up so that you become better and better and better at it decorative pruning is uh, a fun uh, leisure stress reducer um, a lot of people say that, you know, plants can de-stress a person. I don't know all about that. All I know is that when I was decoratively pruning, there wasn't too much that worried me. It was a very relaxing catharsis, and I really enjoyed it. Like the orchard I was telling you about, the olive orchard. It was a decorative pruning, although it was selective pruning at the same time. And I'll tell you what. Uh, I was a tired hombre at the end of the day, but my gosh, I'd put on Audible and listen to a book and go at it, and it was really a, a, I can't tell you guys, it was a stress reducer, it really was. And I really, truly enjoyed it. 
not so much the 90 uh, trees of pilings that I had to get rid of. That was just pure freaking work. There's just no two ways about it. But the actual uh, doing it and then getting down and looking at it and, you know, seeing what needed to come off from each, each tree, it was really kind of a, a neat little challenge. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and it wasn't hot that time of year, so it was, it was kind of fun. Okay, our last topic of today is going to be the tools. Tools uh, for pruning is really kind of simple. And for the basics, all you're really going to need is about four. You're going to need a, uh, a quality hand pruner. You're going to need a quality lopping shear. Uh, head shears if, if you need to hedge something. And you need something of a pole pruner. A pole pruner with a rope pull with a bypass pruner at the top of it and maybe a, a curve saw for uh, high ups, that kind of stuff. If you had those things, you got 90% of everything you're going to need to ever prune taken care of tools wise. Now there are other ones you get off into your power tools like you can get into uh, power hedge trimmers, you can have chainsaws, you can have uh, pole chainsaws. Um, you can have uh, pole hedge trimmers. But again, I encourage you not to have something so tall that you can't take care of it uh, from the ground and probably less than eight feet. I mean, what is a privacy hedge does not need to be anything more to eight to 10 feet at the most. I had a house in uh, Northern California one time and I had a bay laurel hedge in the back and it kind of uh, backed up a backstop for the half court basketball uh, court that I had in the back and it was set at about eight feet and when I needed to prune it it was closer to 12 feet and even at eight feet on a six foot ladder uh, the thing was a pain in the butt there was just nothing there was nothing fun about taking that thing on uh, it often got infested with uh, aphid and woolly aphid and it was always stinky and messy and drippy so Keep things, keep things eight feet or lower and you will be so thankful for me telling you that. I promise you that. Okay, so lastly, lastly, I want to talk to you about safety. You know, when we get off into this, there's always that gal, always that guy that thinks, I got this, I saw it on YouTube, I'm good to go. I got a ladder, I got a chainsaw, um, I got my buddy coming over, he's got a rope. Yeah, the other one's got a pickup. We're going to take out that eucalyptus tree. We're going to take out that pine tree. We're going to take out that birch tree or that sycamore tree or whatever in the heck it might be. I would really encourage you to know your limitations. Clint Eastwood said it best. A man's got to know his limitations. You've got to know your limitations. The limitations of your equipment, the limitations of yourself. Uh, do not think for a second that uh, trees are not heavy, that you are very light compared to the weight of a tree, and you don't want to have things like this happening to you out there when you're trying to improve your property for whatever purpose. Know your limitations, know when to turn to a professional that can come in and do it safely, um, and make sure that your vehicle insurance is up to date, your property insurance is up to date, your kids and your pets are not there when you're doing this because there's been too many of these happening over the course of years and years and years. And I don't want to have it happen to you, plain and simple. You got to know your limitations and start small, work bigger, uh, call in the pros when you, uh, when you have that little thing going on in your gut that says, I think I can do this. That's a sign, that's a clue. You know, listen to it. It's telling you. It's telling you. You know, take a look at this video. And I don't mean to make fun to anybody, but these are the things that actually go on every single weekend when people have gone beyond their limits. Things like this happen. Was practicing landscape maintenance or if I had a landscape makeover that required tree removal I set myself a limit and I was a uh, I don't know fairly tall guy at 6'2 and 
somewhat strong, knew how to use a ladder, knew how to use equipment and everything else. 20 feet. 20 feet was the highest tree I ever took on. And I made sure that I took care of some of the side branches and everything before, and I got into the tree about the 10 foot height. I would half it and then bottom it. And that was as high as I ever got. Anything beyond 20 feet, I had two companies that I could call and schedule up and they would come in and take care of it. Um, even as a pro, I knew my limits. And that's what I really strongly impress upon you. Now, remember on maintenance, don't forget maintenance as far as your equipment. You know, you get those hand pruners and loppers. Those things are lifetime purchases. Lifetime. Do not throw them in the dirt and try root pruning all the time. Uh, I know a lot of people like to uh, prune roots with lopping shears and stuff like that. Keep it out of the dirt. Make sure you oil it and lube it at least twice a year if you're using it regularly. Store it in a nice dry place. Have a little oil finish on it. Keep them sharp because there's nothing more dangerous and more useless than a dull shear. It really is. It's going to beat the hell out of you and it's going to beat the hell out of the, the tool itself. So keep it sharp. Learn how to sharpen them. It's really, really simple. Uh, even chainsaw blades and stuff, there's nothing more dangerous than a dull chainsaw. So make sure you know how to do it or take it to a place that knows how to do it. Guys, that is what I have for you as far as pruning. It is the time of year where most pruning takes place, January and February, before any sort of bud push or anything starts to come back to life. I want you to get educated on this stuff before you go out, and I hope I've kind of raised your level of awareness on a couple different kinds of pruning, some tools, and some safety. Make sure you get out there with the proper um, garb, on, you know, don't go out there if you're using power equipment with flip-flops and shorts and a tank top. Not the type of pruning um, clothes that I want you to be using. Get those heavy pants, get your gloves, get eye protection, get ear protection. In some case, get even a helmet on your face. Companies like Husqvarna and place like that, they actually have a helmet and an earpiece that you can buy all together if you're going to be on a chainsaw for a while. That's all I got today. I am so glad you stuck with me to the end of this video. Uh, do me a favor. If you haven't subscribed already, hit that subscribe button. I hope you like it and share it. And next week, like every Friday, uh, I will be back at you with another um, informative landscape video. And I look forward to sharing it with you then. Until then, guys, stay safe and healthy. Take care. See you next week.